one I've been sharing for 30 years. Um, I, I already shared it twice this year, and I did six times last year, I just realized. And it, it was born out of a dissatisfaction with the way that I was being taught about culture in a Christian seminary. And I knew there had to be more to it than that. There had to be a deeper understanding. So also it was at that time when we were trying to figure out what a Christian university should look like. We, had a, we realized we had a once in a lifetime opportunity to shape a new institution. And we really wanted to get it right. And we were getting all these different messages from all over YWAM and outside YWAM. You have to do it this way. No, you have to do it this way. No, you can't do that. You have to do this. And it was a, it was a very confusing time. So I was using my time at seminary, uh, 86, 87, to really try to think this through. And I was especially looking at at the teaching of Jesus and how he interacted it with his disciples. So I want to take you to that passage that the Lord just one morning literally opened my eyes in Mark chapter 6, uh, the, the feeding of the 5,000, a passage so well known that that morning I didn't even want to read it again. I, I asked the Lord permission to skip and he said, uh, do you really think you've understood all there is to learn out of that chapter? I said, well, maybe not. I'll read it again. And you know it very well. We won't read it again. But then, uh, then I told the Lord, I came to the end of the chapter and said, I don't see anything new. And he said, keep reading. So I read chapter 7. I thought, wow, two two gospel chapters in one day, I was feeling pretty spiritual. And um, I came to the end of chapter 7, and he said, keep reading. And, and of course, there Jesus does the same miracle, essentially the same miracle. And this is in, a, in the space of a few days or weeks, we don't know exactly. And he does it uh, for different reasons. I think everything he did, he did for several different reasons. Uh, one of them is, uh, this is in, Maureen pointed this out to me years ago. The first miracle he did among the Jews, the, then he moves to the Decapolis, the region of the ten cities where they speak Greek. So the second miracle he did for Greek speakers. So it was once again trying to get through to his followers and all who would hear of the second miracle that God's love was for everyone and not just for the Jews. But the other thing he was doing, and it, it hit me that morning for the first time, it was he was doing this miracle not just for the multitude, but for the disciples. And he usually did that, right? He had a message for the, the multitude, and then that very message, often in parables, sorted them out, and the ones who were hungry came, and came to him afterward and said, what was that about? So I love the multidimensional aspect of his teaching. And, and we, know that, um, we know that he did it again for the disciples because of Mark 6.52. This is after the first miracle. And they're seeing him walking on the water, thought he was a ghost, cried out in fear. And then he says, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got in the boat and the wind stopped. And they were greatly astonished, verse 51 says, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. True learning only comes with a soft heart. True learning must begin with the heart. We have made it a thing of the head, the cognitive transmission of ideas. That itself is a teaching that came much later. But this is why in the university we start with DTS and will not do away with the DTS requirement before any other courses are done. I always used to say, they'll have to shoot me first. And Cynthia would say, stop saying that. 
she knew that that would tempt certain people. <laughs> this is why our YWAM tradition of beginning with worship, as we do in this program, and in lots of our other programs, is so important. Because if our hearts are not tenderized by the Spirit of God, true learning cannot take place. So, what are we to learn from, from these two miracles? I think there, there are several obvious things. I'm sure you've heard messages on this. But the one I want to underline is that the reaction of Jesus to the crowd was completely different from that of the disciples. In the first miracle, they came to him and said, send them away. The hour is late and the place is desolate. Send them away so they can get something to eat. And the difference is clear in the text. Jesus had compassion on the multitude. And compassion will help us see differently. The compassion of God changes all perspectives. So the disciples were, first of all, being self-centered, as they often are, and Mark is the one who, uh, who points this out the clearest of any of the gospel writers. He's very open about the times that Jesus was frustrated with them. And they were concerned, they wanted time with the Lord. It was their debriefing time from their first outreach, and, and they wanted that time, and here all these people were there, and they wanted to get rid of the problem. So they saw the, the hungry multitude as a problem. Jesus saw it with different eyes, and he saw it as an opportunity for the Father to do something and to be glorified. They were impressed with the time and the place, as we are. Look, at these. it's too many people. It's too late if we'd only known six months ago. We don't have the resources. And we're looking at those things which are true, of course, but Jesus was seeing the Father in his infinite resources. But the lesson we're going to spend more time on this morning is um, in chapter 8, after the second miracle, the Pharisees come again to ask him for a sign. And they go back in the boat. And he said to them, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began to discuss one another the fact that they had no bread. Which is understandable. This is a bunch of young men on outreach. They know their leader is not nearly con as concerned with their next meal as they are. They're hungry. And... And the guy who had the work duty of bringing the fish sandwiches along forgot to do it. They're very unhappy with him. He was saying, no, no, I, that, it was me last week, it's him this week. No, I changed because I went to visit my family the other week, so it was him. Why didn't you do it? Well, it wasn't my job to bring the leftover bread, it was my job to buy bread, and there was no place to buy bread, so why didn't you do it if you're so smart? Discussions with disciples about why we have no bread. You have probably been, been in those as I have. And Jesus gets very unhappy with them. Verse 17. Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And you got to feel sorry for these guys. They're talking about lunch, and their beloved teacher gets very angry with them and starts talking about leaven of the Pharisees. But they, they knew the answer, and they were happy they could give their beloved teacher the right answer. Twelve, Lord. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? 
And as I reread that passage that morning for the hundredth time or so, I realized I didn't understand any better than the, the 12 did. What he was getting at. I think he was saying this. And we need to remember that for Jewish people, leaven is very, very negative. I'm sure many of you have had baking experience here. Now I need someone with scissors. Can you just cut the top off? Miranda has some. Let's just pass one around each way. And I'd just like you to take a little bit in your, between your thumb and forefinger and see how fine this powder is. I don't know what it would do to a computer keyboard, but I suggest we not try to find out. Uh, and as you know, it just takes a little tiny bit of this stuff to influence a whole loaf of bread and to make it um, multiply in size two to three times, one baker told me depending on the, the type of, of bread and, and uh, what you're making and all that kind of stuff. And as Christians, we often have a more positive influence of leaven because Jesus used it as an image for the multiplication of the kingdom. But for Jewish people, it was terribly negative. It was the thing they could not take out of Egypt. It was still the thing every Sabbath day that they cleaned their entire house so there would not be one crumb of bread left with leaven in it because then the, the Messiah could not come that evening, that Sabbath time. So when he's saying, beware of the leaven to these Jewish men, they're thinking, whoa, of course we're beware of the leaven. But he said three leavens, the leaven of the, of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and Herod. That's, that's if you go to the parallel part passage in Mark, in Matthew, I mean. So in Mark, the two miracles are in Mark 6 and 8. In Matthew, they're in, in 14 and 16. Chapters 14 and 16. So when I realized I wasn't understanding, I went to Matthew 14 and 16 and reread them there. And Matthew adds a point that Mark does not. Apparently, sometime after... Jesus got really angry with them. We don't know if they're still in the boat or they just got out of the boat or when it is. Sometime after, verse 12 of Matthew 16 tells us, then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching. Of the teaching of the Pharisees, Sadducees. And as I said, when you put the two parallel passages together, you come up with three types of leaven. So Jesus is giving a strong warning here, which I'm, we have underestimated in the church, to beware of the teaching. And this goes straight back to question number two in Genesis, doesn't it? Who told you? Who told you? Who told you what I am like? What you should do to worship me? How you should live your life? Who told you? I think Jesus was saying to them, there is a, a substance working in you, and you can't see it. You can't see it working, like leaven in bread. It cannot be seen working unless you have a microscope. You can only see the results sometime later. But there's a substance working in you that is blinding your eyes, blocking your ears, confusing your understanding, and preventing you from remembering what you should remember. It's working in you like leaven. And you are not seeing what I'm seeing. You're not hearing what I'm seeing. You're not understanding what I'm understanding. And you've, re you've forgotten so much of what you should have remembered. This teaching is, is so strong in us, I'm going to try to give a few examples. I'd like to encourage you to think of examples in your own life, in your own experience. What are these? 
Um, I think the leaven of the Pharisees, and I've, I've checked without this out with my seminary professors, because 10 years after this experience, I did my doctorate and, and used that to really get into the research more formal research as to what the Pharisees believed and taught, what the Sadducees believed and taught, etc. I think the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees is our religious teaching. Because the, the Pharisees were the most religious branch of, of Judaism, right? They were very much into complete observance of the law. They were in would not fellowship at all with non-Jews. They were very separatist. They believed in strict observance of everything. Um, whereas the Sadducees accommodated with the Greeks. They would give their children Greek-speaking names. They would allow their children to marry Greeks. They would fellowship with Greeks. And the, the, the chief priest in Jerusalem was always a Sadducee because he would go into the palace and talk to Pilate, whereas a, a Pharisee would not even do that. He would not go under the roof of, of any Gentile. So this is the branch of Judaism, the Sadducees, that had the Bible translated into Greek uh, 300 years before Jesus, the Septuagint translation. So they were very much into, into Greek thinking. That translation, by the way, kind of accommodated Greek thinking, and the, the image of God that the Old Testament shows was kind of toned down to make God more, um, more like the Greek impersonal force idea, and several of the passages where God is, is uh, like uh, lifting up his arm that show, his, that show him this image of God having body parts, even though he knows he's spirit, those were just really taken down in the translation into the Greek, so they're not nearly as visible in that translation as they are in the older Hebrew translation, the Masoretic text. So, right away. Hello? There is also an example of the teaching of the Greeks influencing the people of God even before the time of Jesus. And what about the, the leaven of Herod? Well... My interpretation of this, as I say, which has been confirmed by people who know a lot more than I do, is that Herod is the strong man over, culture, over the nation, so that's our cultural teaching, the cultural leaven. So I think Jesus is saying here, we all have three sources of teaching. We all have three very strong influences on us. And they are religious, they're scholastic, and they're cultural. How strong? They'll take us to our death. We will give our lives for these teachings. If you read uh, James Smith, his example is the thousands of American young people, men and women, who sign up in the US military to go fight in meaningless wars in faraway nations and gives their lives for that. What does that come from? And that hit me, that example, when I first read it because that's what my family has done for generations. We always joined the military. I did too. My father fought in World War II and my, all my uncles, my grandfather in World War I. I have ancestors who fought in the Civil War who were scouts for the U.S. Army before the Civil War. Uncle Jerome was a mountain man. Hundreds of 15-year-old European girls have gone to Syria to become war brides for ISIS. Hundreds, if not thousands. Where does that come from? Korean Airlines flight. A few years ago, in perfect weather with no mechanical problems, flew straight into a mountainside, crashed and killed a couple hundred people. They recovered the cockpit recordings. 
And it was very obvious that the captain was doing something else and talking to his navigator and co-pilot about whatever he was doing. And both these guys had to know the airplane was going straight for a mountainside. And they did not say anything to the captain. Such as, Captain, um, I'd like to ask your opinion about whether we should crash or not. Why? Because in Korean culture, you cannot ask that question. The language itself will not permit you to ask, to question an authority. In Korean churches, you cannot ask any question of your pastor. They sat there looking at that mountainside getting closer and closer and went straight to their death and did not open their mouths. Korean Airlines changed its policy after that and required all conversations among airline crews to be in English because in English you can ask a question. The teaching of culture, I believe, is, is what Matt was, was uh, doing so well with us. The messages that we picked up as little kids in our family before we get any formal teaching, it's this informal teaching which is the most powerful, which is just what we pick up as a little tiny kid. I am unwanted. It's more overt in some Hindu families who name their daughters Nakus, Nakusha or Nakusi, which means unwanted. So that's, that message is real clear. But in our own families, it's the same message, isn't it? Sometimes. I am insignificant. I should disappear. This is the teaching of the culture. The leaven of Herod that determines our, our very identity. That determines the reality of who we are. And we have, a, you know, we have the example of what is, what were you told as a child? Be a good boy. Be a good girl. What does that mean? That means different things in different cultures. But we internalize this, I need to be a good boy, a good girl, or I'm not a good boy or a good girl. In traditional Asian cultures, girls did not speak up. They even had to speak much softer than men did, much more softly. We knew two different French girls who went out to YOM Asia when it was growing in the, in the 80s, early 80s. And each of them was put in the kitchen in different bases because they could cook well. Uh, and each of them was kicked out of the base for rebellion. Well, we knew these young ladies. And we talked with each of them, did a little debrief with them without knowing the term. And it turned out they were kicked out for being French. Because little French kids are taught to speak up for themselves. That's what being a good boy or a good girl means in France. Is you give your opinion, and if you don't, if you don't, there's something wrong with you. You're a moron or you're stupid or something. So what does that mean to be a good boy, a good girl, a good Christian? Where do we get the idea that if something, some food is really good and, and other people will look at it and think, if I have to eat that, I'm going to throw up all over the place? <laughs> in, uh, in YWAM Homestead Manor in the early years, they would usually have Americans and, and British people. And on the tables, they would have peanut butter, lemon curd, and Marmite. And the British people would sit around waiting for the Americans to try Marmite. And so the Americans would say, what is that stuff? Oh, this is kind of like our version of peanut butter. So the American would put it on as thick as peanut butter and bite into it and realized he was in a very different culture. So you know many examples, durian fruit from Southeast Asia. Yes. <laughs> so I brought some artifacts with me today. The Marmite. 
This cultural artifact is an orphan's boot with a wooden sole from this orphanage. These are cultural artifacts. This one is both cultural and Sadducean. This is Howard Momstead's set of personal weights for measuring before electronic instrumentation. It's the only uh, personal item of Howard's that I kept. Science is all about description and measurement, and if you were a serious scientist, you had to have your personal set of weights. And you couldn't pick them up with your hands, you had to have a tweezers to pick them up with. So please feel free to look at them, and please do not try to take them out. Here's a religious artifact, the 1972 YWAM songbook. <laughs> Youth with a Mission songbook, The Singing Sword. Did you ever see this? That's not the original. The original songbook was a, a mimeographed, typed sheet with songs in it like sing, ringing doorbells for my Lord. I, I'm, I hope that, that one did not make it into there. This is a religious artifact. In the 1970s, if you were a committed Christian, you had to have a hand-tooled leather Bible cover. You could not use your store-bought Bible cover. You had to put your Bible into a hand-tooled leather cover. Anyone else have one of these? Aha! Uh -huh. You did that? <laughs> this is a sign of commitment. What do you do to be a good, committed Christian? This, this is what you do. And you, you walk around with it like this. This is some academic leaven. Uh, is Camille here? She's working. This is, and I could have, it could have been more dense than this. This is three books on qualitative research. Strategies of qualitative qualitative inquiry, the landscape of qualitative research, collecting and interpreting qualitative materials. Uh, this is much more about qualitative research than you want to know. But this is the leaven of the Greeks, the academic leaven distilled into these three books. And of course, when the leaven swirls together and combines, it has a much more positive, a much stronger grip on us. And why is it so strong? Because it's spiritual. It, it's not just a, a teaching in the sense of intellectual. And you can't teach your way out of your leaven or learn your way out of it or help someone else get out of it through teaching. I tried for many years. Unless it's the kind of teaching that is power encounter. Behind every teaching, there are institutions. We get that teaching from school, from church, from family, from media. There are institutions. Behind every institution, there are systems of thought that are uh, when carried to their conclusions, are always idolatrous. Behind every system of thought, there are principalities and powers. And we'll get into this more probably in Module 4. We're not going to take the time this morning. But it's because there are principalities and powers behind these systems that teach us that it's so hard to change. There's a beautiful um, passage in, in John 12 that illustrates this so well. Jesus is praying, I'm sure you remember it, and he ends his prayer and says, Father, glorify your name. 
This is verse 28 of John chapter 12. And a voice comes out of heaven and says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Verse 29 shows us three completely different interpretations of, of that sound. We're in Jerusalem, so the majority of the people are probably influenced by the Greek culture. So the multitude said, it thundered. It thundered. Did you hear that rumble from over the hills, the Judean hills? It thundered. Maybe we're going to have rain this afternoon. Because for the, the Sadducees, one of their core beliefs was, the supernatural does not exist. So they had a material explanation for everything. Whereas the Pharisees, of course, were very much into the supernatural. That's why they were always asking Jesus for signs. Because for them, Messiah had to validate himself by the miraculous. Whereas the Sadducees, being disciples of the Greeks, always wanted explanations. So here's the thing, if you don't believe the supernatural exists and you hear something supernatural or you see it, you've got to come up with a materialist explanation for it. Oh, you say you speak in tongues? Well, what you're really telling me is that you're psychologically weak. You went into a meeting with strong personalities, someone playing the drums really loud. And they told you you needed to speak in another language, so you're babbling. It's not another language. That wasn't the Holy Spirit because he stopped working 19 centuries ago. So this is the explanation of what you think you're experiencing, you poor, weak, dumb person. You're psychologically weak, that's all. The materialist explanation for a supernatural phenomenon. There was another group there. They were the Pharisee-influenced people. And they were sensitive to the supernatural. They're like New Age people today, sensitive to the supernatural, but in total confusion about what's actually out there. So they said, no, no, that wasn't thunder. An angel spoke to him. They could feel the vibes. Whoa, didn't you hear that angel? These people who announce in, in a, during a time of worship that an angel had just showed up in that corner over there. I always kind of wonder, you know, does that happen with you that people say an angel just showed up? So I, I'm not denying that's, imp I'm not saying that's impossible. I really believe in angels, but I just kind of wonder. Anyway, there was a third group there, perhaps composed only of Jesus and John, because John is the only one of the evangelists who reports this event. And they knew who spoke, and they knew what he said. Now, these are the same sound waves coming down out of heaven, the same frequency vibration hitting everyone's ears at the same moment. And there are three completely different and mutually exclusive versions of what just happened. Where is the difference? The difference is in the teaching. It's in the leaven. It's the same sound waves, but we don't see the same thing. We don't hear the same thing. Our culture and our, all our teaching, we know now, puts filters in our brain, literal filters. And uh, in development, human development, the mesh gets finer and finer in the filters. The holes in the net get smaller, if you will. And, and we have to have fil those filters. God created us because undifferentiated, undifferentiated reality would overwhelm us. So he, he, he created us in such a way that reality is filtered. We can't see all the different spectrums of, of light, for example. 
you know, we can't see infrared, we can't see all these different kinds of light. We have to have special instruments if we want to do that. We can't hear everything a dog will hear or, or smell everything a dog will smell. We can't see everything an eagle will see. They see so much more than us. If we had all that information coming at us in all of our senses, we would be literally overwhelmed. So he builds these filters into us already before birth. And then at birth, the filters start coming through the teaching. And the teaching, as we know, is not always negative. A lot of it is positive, and most of it is probably neutral. But those filters literally determine what we see and don't see. I am fascinated to observe how some people can see a plant and others not. I know this because there are many cases of plant abuse in YWAM bases. And, and how you can walk by a plant that's dying 20 times a day and not do anything about it is beyond me. But I know, you know, I understand. I understand completely. Yes. How can you not see that that toilet roll needs to be replaced? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing for kids, little, little kids. Cynthia taught me to see them, to really see them when they come into a room. And you can observe this too. When, when a little kid comes into a room full of adults, some of the adults will see that child. And many will not. Let me put some more uh, characteristics up here. Now, you're going to receive a, an email with many of these things on it, so you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about it right now. But the temptation with the Pharisees is the temptation to power. And the temptation for the Sadducees is the temptation to wisdom. We could say revelation and reason, if we want to broaden the categories. So this temptation to reason, if taken to its extreme, leads us to rationalism. And the most distilled form of rationalism is, is French. We'll get to that. And the temptation to power leads us to the, to ultimately to mysticism. We have both in YWAM. They're very strong. We'll spend more time this morning on the Enlightenment, but let me tell you, the, the leaven of the Pharisees is very strong in our mission. Very strong. I, I shared this uh, message with our global leadership people, I think it was in 2013. <clears throat> And a, a base leader came to me in tears. And he told me that there was a guy who'd been invited to teach at their base who had just started a movement called A Day Without Miracles is a Day Wasted. And he gave his testimony. Every day he'd see a supernatural miracle. Every day. And at the end of his teaching week, he invited any people who would like to join his movement to leave YWAM and join. And several did that weekend. They just left because they wanted to see a miracle every day. Well, they saw a miracle a day for quite a few days. And then one fine morning, God, in his love for them, stopped doing the miracles. They didn't have a miracle that day, and they left the movement. Most of them did not come back to YWAM. Some of them didn't even come back to the Lord. I always used to be irritated with the Pharisees because when they asked Jesus for a sign, it was usually right after he'd done one. 
I thought, what's the matter with you guys? He just did this miracle. What are you coming up and asking for a miracle for? Well, here's the reason why. It's because they wanted the miracle on their terms and their timing. And that's the temptation to the leaven of the, of the Pharisees. We want the miracle on our terms, in our methods, in our timing. And Jesus never did that. So the, the ultimate temptation of the Pharisees is this. God's power is available to me and my terms and my timing. God's power is for me and my terms and my timing. One of the ways this comes out in certain YWAM bases is, oh, if you wanna, if you wanna really meet with God, you have to go to that room over there and soak. That's where God is, and you have to go there and do this certain type of worship in a certain way. I looked in there and a few times when this first started at one of our bases, and it looked a lot to me like soaking meant lying down on the floor sleeping. But I'm not, who am I to judge? I get, I get kind of upset about this because one of the messages that Calvin preached in Geneva with such power was that there is no mediator between humans and God except Jesus and what he did on the cross one time. There is no person, there is no ceremony, there is no place, there is no method where you have to go to meet God. Some people on this base a few years back said, oh, we need a prayer room. We don't have a prayer room. And they get, came and asked me what I thought, which was a mistake. I said, listen, every room in these buildings has been a prayer room for 120 years. And don't tell me I have to go to a room to pray. Because my ancestors were in France and had to leave for their lives, left everything behind for this message that you don't have to do anything like that to worship God. All you need is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Who told you? Who told you you had to do that? Who told you you had to get up and pray early in the morning or God wouldn't hear your prayers? I love to go to Korea and preach that one. <laughs> they still invite me back, or they have until now. Who told you that you had to sit in your quiet time and be quiet for one hour and not have any music? That's what they told us in the 70s. Who told you that if you wanted to really be spiritual, you should sleep less and less and less every night? In Colossians 2... I kind of think I'm going around in circles here, but that's okay because sometimes spirals are the best way to learn. Maureen's doing that a lot in these days. I hope you've noticed how she's doing that. I think personally that Paul picks up on the warning of, of Jesus in Colossians 2 verse 8 and rephrases it for that particular community. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ. And he's got three categories in this passage that line up pretty well with the three types of leaven that Jesus warned about. We're going to get into more detail in the next hour on the Enlightenment, but, and I, I already shared with you the image I had of the perfect theft 
where the Enlightenment stole our heritage in the, na our heritage in the nations, which we know from Psalm 2. The messianic inheritance is the nations, and we share in that inheritance as co-heirs with Jesus. But when we started talking about preparing to teach the nations in the late 70s and 80s, we had so much pushback from dear brothers and sisters who would say that we're not called to teach the nations. That's not the missionary's job. Our job is to plant churches. And then the churches in that nation can teach the nation. I heard this over and over again. Our inheritance is not the nations. And we leave it to other people to teach the nations. We had a U of N conference during the LTS in Barbados. We were in this little tourist hotel. And in the downstairs dining room, they had a TV on all day. And we go down there one morning for breakfast, and who's on the TV but Oprah? Oprah teaching in over 100 nations. How should you live your life? Well, Dr. Phil, what do we do about this? In our U.S. presidential elections, we're having a debate on different teachings of who we are as a nation. What is our national identity? What should it be? And those are teachings. Here's the other image I have for the, the Enlightenment. Not only is it the perfect theft that our inheritance has been taken and we, we have forgotten that we even had it. I used to tell my Swiss friends who tell me this, this nation's on our job. I said, listen, Calvin did it already. He did it. He taught the nations. We know exactly what his teachings were and how they went to the nations and how they influenced the nations. We can track that. So I told him, if you don't have faith for the future, at least have faith for the past. So one of my jobs is to, to help Swiss people remember what God did right here. Because we do not remember. But the other image I had was that it's a prison, and it's the perfect prison because we can't see the bars. We don't even know we're in prison. That's why it's the perfect prison. But like in Susan's image, we're, we're fenced in and we don't even know it. We can't see the fence. It's not just that the fence is, is made of clear bars that we see through. The fence is in our minds. The fence is in those filters in our brains. The fence is in the leaven that tells me who I am, who that person is right there what that interaction just meant, what that lack of interaction just meant. We're in a prison, friends. The good news is, and there is good news, the Lord Jesus came to set us free. And we'll get to that before lunch. How do we get free? And we've been already hearing a lot of, a lot of how. Um, let's go on in chapter 2 here. Paul writes to the Colossians about several things that happened on the cross. And of course it was having our sins forgiven. And that's in verse 14. But then there's this whole other dimension of what happened in verse 15 of chapter 2. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through himself. So there's this victory over the powers of evil at the cross. But then the very next verse starts out, and it says, Therefore, and Pastor Reese Thomas and 
Kona would say all the time, when you see a therefore in the scripture, ask what it's there for. And I had a lot of teaching on verse 15 on spiritual warfare back, back in the day, but they never went on to 16. Because he triumphed over them, therefore... Let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Don't let them teach you. Because he triumphed over them, their teachings have no more effect. He goes on in verse 20 and says, If you had died with Christ to the elementary principles of this world, the stoicheia is the Greek word, I'll put that on the board. As if you were living in the world, do you, why do you submit yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Which all refer to things destined to perish with the, with the using. In accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. Who told you? Who told you you can't touch that, you, this, you can't drink that, you can't go there? This is the full gospel, friends. We don't have to do any of that stuff. We don't have to do what they say, whether the, the they is our culture, our religion, or whatever. We don't have to do that. And that will not profit us. It makes us feel more religious. It makes people think, wow, that's a really, really committed Christian there. Did you see that hand tool Bible cover? That's the full gospel. That Jesus did not just come to forgive us our sins. He came to set us free. And set us free from the teaching that twists and warps how we even know what is real. How we know who we are. How we know who each other are. How we know who God is. How much does he love us? I submit to you that we don't know yet. And we're on a journey of finding out. Part of that, I think, is for our protection. Because his love is holy. And we have to be ready to embrace him in order for him to fully presence himself with us. This is why in his love for us, sometimes he, he pulls away a bit, as he did with Israel. They said, no, we can't handle that presence directly. I think that grieved the heart of God, but he knew they couldn't. They weren't ready for that much of him, for that much holiness. So he agreed to teach through Moses. One of the ways that the leaven of the Pharisees works among us today is that we have many, many young people. First of all, their major ambition in life is to see miracles. Um, some of you who teach in DTS know this. Is I think Maureen has done it too, is ask the DTS students, what is your main ambition with Jesus? And it's most often to see miracles, and especially to see the, the dead raised which is great, there's nothing wrong with it, but is that all? What about your nation, which is going to hell in a handbasket, as we say in English? What about your inheritance in your nation, among the nations? What about the, all the lost out there? And then the other thing they, they desire, and this is a, a lovely desire, in itself is, is the presence of God, the feeling of the presence of God, I should say. That experience of the feeling of the presence. But Danny Lehman is very concerned about this, and he points out that one-third of the Psalms are all about feeling the, the lack of the presence of God, the absence of the presence of God, which would seem to indicate to us that that's a normal, common part of Christian experience. And what are these young people going to do when they don't feel anything three days in a row? Do 
Do we want God himself or manifestations of him, whether miracles or wisdom? Okay, we'll continue on after the break.